it. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Valeria uh, Venturini. I hope I said that correctly. Um, Valeria is joining us from Spain, from Barcelona. Um, so I will um, introduce her uh, before she starts her talk. So Valeria um, did her uh, bachelor's degree and master's degree in physics in Italy. Um, and uh, both degrees, um, she got perfect GPA, summa cum laude, uh, uh, graduated um, in um, 2016. And um, during that time, um, she was um, working on um, um, spectroscopic methods like Raman uh, imaging. And she also did a, a, a visiting student stay in the University of Southern California during that time. Um, after she uh, finished her uh, master's degree, um, she joined the uh, group of uh, Stefan Weiser um, at the Institute of Photonic Sciences in Barcelona um, and co uh, jointly supervised uh, by um, uh, Verena Ruprecht um, at the CRG, uh, the Genomics uh, Center in Barcelona. Um, where uh, she was a um, Ikfos Stepson PhD fellow um, funded by the Marie Curie uh, Fellowship Program. Um, and um, uh, her thesis was um, uh, about um, looking at mechanisms and functions of um, nucleus as a mechanosensor. Um, and she recently published a really beautiful paper in science that I'm sure many of you have already read uh, about how nucleus can measure shape changes to control dynamic cell behavior, which I think is um, mainly what we will hear about today. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, she has also won several awards, including um, uh, Best PhD Poster Award and Best Talk Award. So um, uh, very excited to have you here and look forward to your talk, Valeria. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, you see fine? Okay, well, thanks again for the introduction, for giving me this opportunity today. So I will go through the main results of my PhD project. And when, we, when I started, we were really interested in trying to understand how single cells can really uh, adapt their behavior and their dynamics with particular focus on cell migration, depending on the physical environment they are. And why this? So we know cell migration happens from the early stages of embryo development. Here you can see uh, mesoderm cells labeled in green in the zebrafish embryo. And at the onset of gastrulation, these cells specify and collectively migrate in the opposite direction of the spreading tissue. And this step is essential for uh, tissue development, embryo development, but also like for the future formation of the different organs of, of, the, of the zebra fish. And immune cell, uh, cell migration is also important in the adult tissue where, for example, immune cells migrate in really tight and narrow spaces through our, uh, throughout our body to eat pathogens. So this movie was acquired in the in area of a zebra fish embryo and all plasma membranes are labeled in orange and bacterias are this cyan dot. And you can see some immune cells really crawling uh, within this tissue. I will play it again and eating pathogens within, within, within this space. And on the other hand, I mean, we know that the same mechanisms are also used by cancer cells. Your cancer cell, one single cancer cell is labeled in green and is migrating through blood vessels. And what we know is that this is one of the first steps of cancer metastasis and therefore spreading. And even though cell migration can look very different and happen in different, in really different uh, tissues, spaces, and let's say occasions, what really fascinates us and me is that even though it can look so different, uh, all these cells are using the same molecular machinery. And this is the actomyosin cortex. So I guess you all know that the actomyosin cortex is a thin layer underneath the plasma membrane of cells composed by actin and uh, uh, filaments and non-muscular myosin 2, uh, bipolar thick filament. And this is a really uh, thin and dense network, but the really key point of this structure and, and what really gives, uh, gives it unique properties is that thanks to net actin polymerization, this allows cells 
to uh, produce protrusive forces and thanks to myosin tumor protein activity also contractile forces. And the combination of these two different um, properties within a cell and within a tissue and in different places of each tissue and each cell is what really allows for different types of movement, different types of migration and a lot of beautiful process uh, we'll look at. And, it, and this is really what allows cells to move in different ways. So classically cell migration is divided in mesenchymal modes where cells move, really crawl onto the substrates with high protrusive force uh, that's a given by net acting polymerization at the cell front. This is really adhesive. And this, uh, th this property, let's say, allows cells to move with a speed that are in this, in this range. On the other hand, cells can also move with a more amoeboid manner. And this is uh, happening most, mostly on 3D spaces is based on friction and pushing forces from the cells to the substrate that doesn't need adhesion, but typically is associated with high myosin 2 activity. And this allows cells to move actually much faster than in the mesenchymal mode. And what is really striking is that cells can switch in between these two modes, depending and, and tune their migration uh, properties in time. And what really, uh, let's say, allows cells to switch in between these two modes is on one side the cell state, meaning the level of, for example, cellular contractility, actin dynamics, or the adhesion strength each, each cell has, but also the physical environment. So whether the space in which a specific cell is, is 2D, 3D, there are smaller pores, smaller spaces, different densities, or for example, confinement, that we will talk a lot during this talk, this is what can really define how a single cell moves within its space. And to give you a practical example of this, this is a dendritic cell expressing life at GFP moving on a 2D substrate. And you can see this really nice actin protrusion at the front as the cell moves. But if we take the same cell and we just put it on a 3D collagen assay, you can already realize that the way this cell moves looks a bit different, just from a qualitative point of view, let's say. And this is only due to the different in 3D environment. So what we know is that the cell microenvironment with all its, its properties and characteristics can really affect the migration phenotype of the cell. And, and let's say the, this, arrow, this connection really relies on the fact that cells are equipped with mechanosensitive pathways that allow them to sense the space in which they are, the physical environment, and then tune the migration phenotype. And to do so, cells need to do some changes in their actomyosin cortex, both assembly, but also dynamic and, and regulation. And therefore, if we want to understand this connection, we need to ask ourselves, how does the physical microenvironment controls actomyosin cytoskeleton assembly and dynamics? And related to this question, I will show you an example related to mechanical confinement. It was the main focus of my thesis. And this is because mechanical confinement alone is sufficient to induce or change the migration behavior of single cells. So here you can see a bright film movie of progenitor stem cells derived from zebrafish embryos. And on a 2D substrate, they show this typical blebbing behavior that this is what they would do in the living embryo. So it's exactly the same. And if we apply a gentle mechanical confinement just by, a, let's say, placing these cells in between two glass surfaces, these cells rapidly transform to this amoeboid phenotype that is termed stable bleb, and they all migrate in a really fast and persistent way. And what was already shown is that mechanical confinement alone induces myosin two motor protein to get recruited to the cell cortex in a very similar way of by activating the Roro pathway chemically. So here we're only activating the myosin through by using lysophosphatidic acid that activates the Roro pathway, and we get the same phenotype of myosin two recruitment at the cortex and stable blood transformation. And these polarized cells are characterized by high uh, myosin-2 density at the rear, while the blood is always depleted of myosin-2, and this is the cell front, so the direction towards which the, the cell migrates. But I will go through this uh, again. And so this is really suggesting the mechanical confinement alone induces myosin-2 activation and recruitment at the cortex. And what was also shown is that this increase in cellular contractility and associated increase of cellular blebbing can in induce this polarized state. So basically when a cell has a really high fluctuation in the cortical tension or the bleb gets really large because of this high myosin 2 activity, 
basically the cell won't make it to retract the bleb anymore. And then the bleb will keep growing and the cell will try to keep putting myosin to within the bleb. And this will start this uh, retrograde flow from front to back of both actin and myosin. And this is what coupled to the environment through friction allows for the cell to move. And therefore this really requires this 3D environment for, for the frictional coupling. Importantly, this stable blood migration is not a unique of zebrafish progenitor stem cells, but HeLa cells when plated in confined and non-adhesive environment, switch from a mesenchymal migration mode to the stable blood migration mode, as you can see in this movie from the PLS lab. And recent studies also show that even a small organism like channel flagellates are capable of switching from a flagellate to a meoboid mode when placed in confined environment, really suggesting that this mechanism is conserved across species and cell lines and, and, and really a general principle. So when we started my, my project, I, what I really try to understand is if is there a conserved mechanosensitive pathway capable of transducing cellular shape deformation upon mechanical confinement into the regulation of myosin 2 that then controls amyloid motility. And to answer this question, so we use a zebrafish as a model system. And I mainly work with blastula stages where all the cells that are here in this uh, brown area uh, within the embryos are all stem and identical. However, it's really hard if you work in an in vivo context as other in vivo contexts to really uncouple the mechanical forces from the biochemical signals that the cell would feel within the embryo because of normal embryo development. So what we do, is to dissociate these cells from the embryo, culture them in vitro. And we know that we observe that the standard phenotype is the same. And then we can really tune and play around with both mechanic, mechanical forces, but also biochemical signaling, tuning, for example, I mean, using drugs or all other methods that are normally available for cell culture. And however, this approach always allows us to go then back to the embryo and see, for example, our findings are, are still an in vivo relevance or, or uh, so on. And to, uh, to really play with the mechanical forces, what we do is to change the microenvironment in which our cells are cultured. To do so, we use 3D biomimetic approaches. So we mainly use core slips that are uh, functionalized with PDMS and with pillars that act as microspacer to confine our cells. And these cover glass are mounted on a PDMS uh, suction cup that is also connected to a pressure controller. So in standard condition, this cover slip is not touching our cells. They're plated on a standard uh, cell, uh, cell culture plate. And the cells are therefore in suspension, so unconfined. And if we look at these cells in more detail, here you see a progenitor stem cell uh, expressing myosin to GFP, but also staying with lean tomato for the plasma membrane. And uh, the DNA here is in blue. You can see that these cells really bleed isotropically. And if we look at the side view, the transversal view of this cell, you can see that the blep is actually happening in 3D and these cells are just, just suspended. And what then we do is to lower the pressure of our pressure controller. And this basically brings the cover slip down until the cells are confined within two consecutive pillars. And therefore the height of the pillar imposes the height at which we are confining our cells. And if now we look at the same cells, you can really appreciate how the cell is deformed in this case, at seven micrometer confinement, considering that the cell I showed you before was around 20 to 25 micrometer diameter. So we are really squeezing to a third. And if we look at the transversal view, you can really appreciate how flattened these cells get once we are confining them. And also already that myosin two motor protein get recruited to the cell cortex as the cells are confined. And to, to answer the question of how do cells respond to different degrees of shape deformation, what we did is to confine them at different heights, and, but discrete, discrete values. So in this case, I'm showing you from the unconfined state to the seven micrometer confinement I showed you before. And this is basically our limit as below this threshold, we are really like start to kill basically all the cells. And this is, as I said, a third of their diameter. And what we observe is that a higher amount of myosin 2 gets recruited at the cortex. Here is symbolized by this uh, color scale where the myosin, uh, high myosin 2 intensity is in yellow and the low in blue. So you see that the cortex gets more yellowish and also a larger area of the cortex is actually because the cell gets larger. So it's all getting brighter. 
And at the same time, the cellular blebs here pointed by these orange asteris gets larger as another sign of the increased contractility that this cell have. And by, by quantifying the relative amount of myosin 2 that is at the cell cortex with respect to the bleb, we observe a continuous enrichment of myosin 2 motor protein at the cortex by lowering the confinement height. And this already tells us that single cells are actually able to sense different degrees of shape deformation. And they don't, they don't behave, let's say, in a binary way, but they can really understand how, how much we are confining and then adapt their cortical level to this, uh, to this deformation. Importantly, these, uh, these values are constant in time. So already if we look at a suspension cell as blebbing with myosin 2 label, you can appreciate that as the cell bleb, myosin 2, motor, myosin 2 levels look stable in time. And the same happens in confinement. So when we confine the cell, cells bleb, bleb get attracted and new bleb appear, but the myosin 2 level at the cortex of these cells are constant in time. And by quantifying these, indeed, we saw that, myosin, that mechanical confinement is really imposing the cortical contractility level of these cells with higher myosin 2 levels for a higher degree of deformation at lower confinement height, and that this value then stays constant in time. And so really telling us that the mechanical deformation control the set point of cortical contractility and therefore the stiffness of these cells at the single cell level. And then if we do the opposite, so instead of applying the mechanical confinement as, as, uh, after a certain time, but we release this mechanical confinement, what we saw is that cells instantaneously release their myosin to motor protein from the cell cortex. And we quantified this also at longer time, and we could really show that these cells adapt their cortical contractility really continuously uh, to the deformation. And therefore, we concluded that the deformation is continuously sensed because cells can really continuously adjust their contractility to the deformation that they are sensing. And once the cells are confined and they have higher contractility levels, they spontaneously transform to stable blood cell, as you can see in this movie, and they start to migrate. And because of the higher contractility, we observe at a lower confinement height, we also observe a higher fraction of stable bleb polarized and motile cells at a lower confinement height. And importantly, we can uh, completely inhibit this process by blocking myosin 2, treating the, treating the cell with blebistatin, giving the central role of myosin 2 uh, accumulation in stable bleb transformation and migration. And once the cell is polarized, also the cortex gets, gets massively polarized. And you can see uh, here in, this, in the basal cortex of a, a stable bleb cell, how myosin 2 is enriched at the cell rear, that the front is actually depleted of myosin 2, and then that there is a cortical retrograde flow opposite to the direction migration as the cell moves. And this is what really gives propulsion to these cells and allows for movement. So if we now look at both polarized and non-polarized cells in, in confinement, you can see that non-polarized cells are blebbing a lot. They're just moving a bit around. In this case, you see myosin 2 labeled in blue to yellow and the nucleus and the plasma membrane respectively in gray and, and magenta. And if, you see, if we now look at a stable bleb cell, you can really appreciate how fast it moves and actually always runs away from, from my field of view in this time-lapse movie. And what we did, we tracked these cells and could really show that stable bleb cells not only have a higher uh, instantaneous velocity during their tracks, but they're really highly directional. They really keep their the migration direction for, in this case, half an hour. They're super directional, super persistent, and they, and they move actually quite fast. So one of our questions was really like, why this is happening and not, uh, not only how. So what we tried to do to, to understand if this uh, had a meaning was to confine cell below, like underneath one PDMS pillar. So the cyan line is identifying here one PDMS pillar. You can see that the cell underneath this area are larger than the one outside that are actually unconfined. And as expected, what we quickly observed, really in few minutes, is that only in the confined area, cells polarize and transform to stable bleb cells. And because of the really fast migration, they quickly run away from the confinement area 
and then we know the wood rivers, their cortical contractility, and their phenotype. Therefore, suggesting that stable bed transformation upon confinement is somehow equipping these cells with an evasion reflex mechanism that really allows them to quickly run away from any confined area, as it could um, maybe, let's say, happen in a, in a tissue environment. So what I told you until now is that myosin-2 cortical accumulation is, depends on the degree of the deformation, is fast, stable in time, and reversible upon release. And what I also checked during my project is that it's actually independent of cell fate or pre-existing migration programs. So mesenchymal migrating cells can absolutely do the same. Ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm cells as well is independent of adhesion. So both cell-to-cell -cell and cell-to-substrate adhesions or any surface coating of transcription and translation of caspase activity on structure activated ion channels like the piezo family, and of the presence or not of microtubules. Still, let's say, open, leaving this question open of how do single cells control myosin-2 when they are confined? So we started to really look for a mechanosensor. And what, what we know is that most of mechanosensor either reside in the plasma membrane, and there are really many, uh, many different mechanosensing elements. We know that cells, for example, uh, reinforce their adhesions depending on the physical environment they are. We know, as I said, that there are mechanosensitive ion channels and also protein. They can locally sense, sense the tension and curvature of the plasma membrane, but also the nucleus itself as an organelle is rich in mechanosensitive element. And actually the same principles that mechanosense uh, forces from on the plasma membrane also happen in the, in the nucleus. As for example, nuclear pore complexes open up on stretch, the link complex, can also um, grow and reinforce the, the, the structure. And there are other proteins that can really translocate upon changes in tension. So what we did to understand if the mechanosensitive element re uh, reside in the plasma membrane or, or in the nucleus was to correlate the mechanoresponse with different deformation as all these mechanosensitive elements need to be triggered by changes, changes in the intention or stretch and therefore deformation of either plasma membrane or nuclear envelope. So we look again at the myosin-2 cortical accumulation for different confinement height. That was the first plot I showed you. And what we realized is that there is a first region where there is no myosin-2 accumulation and a second region in which myosin starts to get activated and um, accumulates at the cell cortex. And uh, the specific level at which this happens depends on the confinement height. So really defining a, a, a bimodal behavior. And what we did to understand where the mechanosensitive element resides was to correlate a myosin to cortical accumulation with, for example, the relative cell diameter. So the diameter of cells uh, normalized to the diameter they had in suspension. So really telling us how much we are deforming each cell. And as you can see, the cell diameter starts to increase already at 80 micron as the cells are around 20 to 25 micrometer. So telling us that uh, these, two, these two quantities are not correlating with each other. But then we did the same with the relative nucleus diameter. And what we saw is that actually this threshold, that is basically the 30 micrometer confinement, really corresponds with the nucleus deformation threshold. And that uh, above this, this threshold, there is no myosin to accumulation and no nuclear deformation. But below this value, myosin to accumulation of the cortex scales almost linearly with nuclear deformation. And if we look at cells confined at different heights, you can see here in the top for 13 micrometer that the nucleus is indeed already flattened and then appreciate how deformed the nucleus gets at seven micrometer confinement when it's really uh, basically squeezed in between the lower and the, and the upper plane. And what we also observe is that even though myosin two cortical accumulation is stable in time when cells are divided, there is uh, one exception, let's say to this process, and this is when cells enter mitosis. So here, the nucleus, the nuclear envelope broke down. You see uh, the nucleus lab labeled with H2A and cherry, and until the, the chromosomes are fully condensed, then you can appreciate now that there is no cortical myosin two anymore at the cell cortex. And we define as time zero, the moment in which the nuclear envelope breaks down 
that we can actually nicely see using the myosin to reporter because normally it's excluded from the nucleus and at some point it really massively diffuse into the nucleus suggesting that the nuclear envelope broke down. And what we saw is that from this moment, myosin to cortical accumulation is drastically reduced until going basically to, to one when the cell is, is undergoing mitosis. And we quantified this for different cells and really saw that cells cannot accumulate myosin throughout the cortex when they're undergoing cell division. And suggesting that single cells require an intact, an intact nuclear envelope to sense shape deformation. So we can add to the list uh, before that actually myosin to a cortical accumulation upon confinement correlates with nuclear deformation and depends on nuclear envelope integrity. And this tells us that instead of asking ourselves how single cells can sense mechanical confinement, we should actually think about how uh, the nucleus of each cell can sense physical shape deformation. And to do so, the first thing we did was to look at the nuclear envelope, as most of the mechanosensory elements really reside in this structure. And we know that the nuclear envelope is made by two uh, different lipid bilayers, the outer and the inner nuclear membrane. And to label the inner, and the tension activates this mechanosensitive pathway. And to label the inner nuclear membrane, we um, looked at a protein called lap 2 beta that resides in it. And the first thing we observed by looking at these cells, uh, cells expressing lap 2 beta GFP in suspension is that the inner nuclear membrane presents a lot of invaginations and ruffles. And these are actually kind of moving around. It's not a static view. Like these invaginations are really dynamic. And are really, the, the nucleus is really moving quite a lot as the cell bleb. But surprisingly, when we confine these cells, the nuclear invagination almost disappear. The nuclear envelope looks stretched out. And it's also much more static in time as it's completely under, under stretch. So we look now at uh, the, the, sa the same cells. So expressing lap 2 beta GFP to label the inner nuclear membrane at different confinement height. And you can appreciate that this un unraveling or unfolding of the inner nuclear membrane is continuous as we lower the confinement height. And what we also did was to uh, quantify the local curvature of suspension or confined nuclei in this case. And you can see not only that the curvature of confined nuclei is much lower as, this, the, as the envelope is really uh, opened up, but it's also much more static in time. So in the suspension case, it's really wobbling a lot around while in, in confinement gets much more stretched and static. And to quantify this unraveling, we quantify the nucleus area to perimeter ratio that increases by lowering the confinement height. And we then quantified the area of these ruffles in a parameter called invagination ratio that is here described. And what we saw is that this invagination ratio decreases as lowering the confinement height. And importantly, these two, these two changes happen at almost constant nuclear volume and total surface. So it's not that the, the nucleus is getting, I don't know, smaller, bigger, anything like this is losing a little bit volume, but it's not statistically significant. So it's really a real, there's a reshape of the nuclear envelope itself. And this tells us that if we are squeezing, let's say one nuclear ideally, the nuclear envelope is really undergone, is really under tension and stretch. And because of this reason, we, uh, we thought of a paper that was published a few years back about leukocyte recruitment at the wound side. So they also use the graphic model system and perform tissue injury by, by laser cut. And what is known is that at the injured side, you would rapidly get immune cells recruited. And it, this is also associated with a gradient of eicosanoids that act as a chemotractant for the leukocytes to be recruited at, recruited at the wound. And what, uh, what they published is that this is associated uh, with the activation of a protein called uh, cytosolic phospholipase A2 uh, in the cells that are very close to the wound that undergo massive cell and nuclear swelling. And in these cells, the nuclear envelope gets stretched out and the CPLA2 can bind at the nuclear envelope in a calcium dependent way. And it's a lipase, so it cleaves phospholipids. This releases arachidonic acid and then is processed by other pathways in the production of inflammatory molecules like these ecosanoids that are ne necessary for the leukocytes to be recruited at the wound. So what we did was to test the role, the specific role of CPLA2 in our process. So here I'm showing you again a movie of uh, cells co uh, confined at seven micrometer expressing myosin 2 GFP. 
in a control case. And you can appreciate how uh, myosin 2 gets recruited at the cortex. And if we do the same by inhibiting uh, CPLA2 you, by using a chemical inhibitor, you can already see that myosin 2 levels get much lower. And we quantify this and indeed so that cells require CPLA2 to activate myosin 2 upon mechanical confinement. And uh, according, I mean, at the same time, the, the reduction of, of cortical myosin 2 prevents cells to polarize. So we see a large reduction of a fraction of polarized and motile cells upon CPLA2 inhibition. And importantly, if we ectopically activate myosin 2 by using this lysophosphatidic acid in the present, it, let's say when CPLA2 is inhibited, cells can fully transform in suspension. And this proves that myosin 2 is fully competent to bind at the cell cortex when CPLA2 is inhibited. And therefore, CPLA2 is really upstream of myosin in, in mechanosense in the process. And what we also showed is that CPLA2 medi mediates myosin 2 activation and stable bed transformation for the different height tested at different developmental stages and for all the different cell fates we, we, which we tried. Uh, we also tried to interfere with CPLA2 by building a dominant negative construct that we overexpress in our cells, and this drastically reduced the the, the ability of cells to sense mechanical confinement and activate myosin 2. We could also prevent the cortical myosin 2 enrichment by using a genetic approach that is by injecting a morpholino that um, prevents the splicing of the protein. And we could also nicely rescue the phenotype by uh, injecting a CPLA2 RNA in the morphant background and uh, rescue myosin 2 cortical accumulation and amyloid motif. And this really tells us that CPLA2 allows single cells to sense shape deformation in confined environment, controlling myosin activity and amyloid motility. To then really check if CPLA2 is required in the nucleus or active in the nucleus, we first of all check for its localization. So uh, CPLA2 coupled with GFP localizes in the nucleus of our cells. Now we'll show you these with sketches. So here the black is the highest intensity. And what we did to understand if CPLA2 is really active there was to use, we, uh, we developed a CPLA2 nuclear export signal construct that brings CPLA2 back a bit, at least partially to the cytosol of cells. And then we couple the CPLA2 nest construct with leptomycin B that is an inhibitor of nuclear export and therefore brings back the CPLA2 construct in the nucleus. And this trick allows us to really play by using a chemical drug with the localization of the protein. And then we use this construct to perform a rescue experiment. So here, all cells are derived from embryos injected with the morpholino. So they don't have CPLA2. Let's say the endogenous protein production is, is blocked. And then they are further injected with the CPLA2 nest construct. Here you can see the normal construct. So there is still a part on the nucleus, but most of it is in the cytosol. And cells, when they're confined, they have really low myosin 2 levels. And when we add leptomycin B that brings back the protein to the nucleus, we see an enrichment of cortical myosin 2 levels. And this is indeed what we saw by quantifying this different, um, this different condition. And we observe a full rescue of myosin 2 accumulation at the cortex only when the protein is in the nucleus, really telling us that CPLA2 is required in the nucleus of cells to activate myosin 2 upon mechanical cell deformation. And then we checked for uh, signs, let's say, or proofs of CPLA2 um, activity upon confinement. And what was reported is that CPLA2 binds at the inner nuclear membrane of cells. But what we saw is that when we confine cells ex expressing CPLA2 GFP, only in the 2% of the cases, uh, CPLA2 translocates at the inner nuclear membrane, while in most of the cases, our probes were staying, they were normally, they were, let's say, maintaining their localization in the nucleoplasm. So we tried different probes and different approaches, but basically always got the same, the same output. And then what we thought is that actually CPLA2, when it is at the nuclear membrane, we, we are not sure how, how long it stays there or what are the dynamics of this translocation, but what it was known from previous studies is that CPLA2 is a lipase, so it cleaves phospholipid, and this allows the release of arachidonic acid. And what we did was to quantify arachidonic acid production in a label-free way by using Raman spectroscopy. So we showed that 
arachidonic acid is produced and released in the cytosol of cells upon mechanical confinement, and that this production is, um, let's say, that CPL2 is required for this process to happen. So if we treat cell with the CPL2 inhibitor, we can completely block arachidonic acid production. And this really tells us that CPL2 is activated upon mechanical confinement and releases arachidonic acid. But then how do we go from arachidonic acid to myosin 2? So what was known is that this process is essential for the production of prostaglandin and eicosanoids that are essential in the inflammatory cascade. So we ask ourselves if any kind of extracellular signaling is also involved in the activation of myosin 2 upon confinement. And what we did was to confine cells at really high density underneath a pillar. So within this magenta line, I'm confining cells to approximately 10 micrometer, while outside cells are unconfined and at really high density. And you can already see that only within this area, cells get actually polarized and transformed to stable blood. And here, the only cell that has no myosin is a mitotic cell. And within this experiment, we, let's say, selected couples of cells with one cell being confined and one cell being unconfined, and we quantified myosin 2 accumulation in these pairs of cells. So if the deformed cells activate myosin 2, but also releases some molecules that are then activating myosin 2 in other cells, then we would expect the unconfined cell to also upregulate myosin 2 at the vortex. But this was not the case, and only confined cells massively accumulated myosin 2 at the cortex, while suspension cell had myosin 2 uh, accumulation level that are that are not statistically significant from normally, let's say, suspension cells at low density. So this tells us that arachidonic acid is activating myosin 2 in a cell in a single cell level. So it's really cell autonomous. But still, how arachidonic acid can activate myosin 2. So what we did was to test non-regulator of myosin 2 activity. So we uh, injected a dominant negative version of rho A, we treated the cells with the ROC inhibitor or the myosin light chain kinase inhibitor. And what we saw is that myosin 2 cortical accumulation requires the ROC pathway, but not the myosin light chain kinase, really suggesting that CPL2 controls myosin 2 activity in a cell autonomous way, mediated by arachidonic acid and the ROC pathway. So, concluding this part, I told you that by lowering the confinement height or say the mechanical confinement induces this continuous inner nuclear membrane unfolding. And this is what triggers CPL2 uh, activation that directly controls cortical contractility and stable blood migration under confinement. That CPL2 is required in the nucleus of cell to then metabolize arachidonic acid in the cytosol sort of cells. And this is what controls uh, myosin 2 in a cell autonomous way and via the RORO pathway really suggesting us that the nucleus is acting as a mechanical gauge that allows cells to not only sense the mechanical confinement they're subject to in a dynamic way, but also tuning their behavior. So by knowing all of this, we ask the opposite. So is nuclear deformation sufficient to control myosin 2 level and in the nuclear membrane stretch in particular? So what we thought is to use hypotonic swelling to really swell the cell, swell the nucleus, and try to see if the phenotype was the same. And indeed, we saw that by uh, applying hypotonic swelling to our cells, we can increase their area, their nuclear area, and unfold the inner nuclear membrane. And you can see this by the lower invagination ratio and the higher nuclear area to perimeter, but also by this uh, imaging where we, where we label the inner nuclear membrane of cells. So we then looked at myosin 2 in swollen cells. Here again, a movie of control cells in isotonic media. And then as soon as we apply hypotonic shock, cells get larger. And you can already appreciate that myosin 2 motor protein get enriched to the cortex of cells. And we quantified this. And we could actually observe a continuous myosin 2 enrichment by lowering the um, osmolarity of the media. But this value was much lower than what we observed upon mechanical confinement, even though the inner nuclear membrane looked actually quite similar in terms of, of unfolding. And it was even more strikingly to see that almost no stable blood polarized cells could be observed upon hypotonic swelling. So this tells us that even though hypotonic shock is inducing inner nuclear membrane unfolding and myosin to activation, still cells are somehow able to, to understand, let's say, for swelling them or confining them and really to adapt their dynamic to the different stress we are imposing. <laughs> 
And so we did a step back. And we know that CPLA2 gets activated upon inner nuclear membrane stretch, and this requires intracellular calcium. In fact, if in confinement we, uh, let's say, chelate all the intracellular calcium using BAPTA-AM, we can completely block this phenotype. And importantly, extracellular calcium is not as needed as the intracellular source. And if we deplete all the extracellular sources, cells are still able to accumulate myosin throughout the cortex. So because of this, we decided to look at calcium level upon a different shape deformation. And what we saw is that upon hypotonic shock, cells only, let's say, increase their intracellular calcium level only of a little, uh, I mean, not too much, while in confinement, this change was really impressive. And even low confinement height induces almost more uh, intracellular calcium than hypotonic shock. And this was even more impressive by looking only at nuclear calcium level with really high value only observed upon uh, mechanical confinement, but not hypotonic swelling. So to really uh, recap, so we, here we concluded that calcium is differentially regulated upon swelling and mechanical confinement. So the first question that came to our mind is if this difference in intracellular calcium is sufficient to explain the difference in cell behavior that is observed upon mechanical confinement and swelling. And then also we ask ourselves, how is calcium differentially regulated upon these two uh, shape changes? So to answer the first question, what we did was to ectopically increase calcium level by adding eunomycin in uh, swollen cells. And what we observed in this movie that cells rapidly increase myosin 2 levels and actually polarize. And importantly, this uh, drastic increase of myosin 2 levels upon um, the addition of a eunomycin hypotonic condition was CPLA2 dependent. So by treating the cell with the CPLA2 inhibitor, we could prevent this uh, further re enrichment. And also, we observe a high fraction of stable blood polarized cell in, uh, in cells treated with a hypotonic uh, shock and a eunomycin. So really suggesting that CPLA2 requires both inner nuclear membrane stretch and high calcium level to then regulate, uh, to then regulate this CPLA2 myosin 2 pathway. So to answer to the last question and uh, to understand how calcium is differentially regulated upon confinement and swelling, what we first thought is that even though the nuclear envelope is actually stretched in the same way in this condition, these cells look quite different. So in confinement, the nucleus gets really close to the plasma membrane, as I show you from the first movies, while in hypotonic shock, everything gets diluted and really far away, and especially the ER. So the ER gets really squeezed in confinement between the nucleus and the plasma membrane, while in hypotonic case, it's far away. And we know that the ER plays a central role in the regulation of intracellular calcium. So what we first did was to look at the ER. Here we're using TIRF microscopy to really look at the interface of the ER with the lower plasma membrane. And although confinement, we could see that the ER was actually quite high that was dynamic and just moving around up the cell blab. But by lowering the confinement height, we could clearly see a central region in which the ER looks really squeezed. And this region appears to be the one underneath the nucleus, as if the nucleus is acting like, like a piston and really squeezing this ER towards the plasma membrane. And, and immobilizing it within the nucleus and the plasma membrane. And uh, this made us focus our ten attention on a couple of ion channel, that is the steam or I complex. Or I reside in the plasma membrane and steam in the ER of cells. And these two ion channels can couple when they physically touch each other. So this distance in the cytosol has to be a few tens, uh, I think like 10 or 15 nanometer was reported to allow to this uh, cytosolic domain of these two proteins to physically bind, attach to each other, and create a supracellular channel that connects the extracellular space with the ER lumen. So we decided to image the steam ORI complex. So here you have steam labeled with CFP and ORI labeled with YFP at the cross section and the basal membrane. So for low confinement height, you can see that both proteins show in the ER and in the plasma membrane an homogeneous localization. While when we apply high confinement here at seven micrometer, the region of the ER that gets squeezed underneath the nucleus is smaller than the whole cell. And within this region, ORI gets massively accumulated. So we have a enrichment of ORI in this region while the black of the cell and the more, let's say, periphelical region gets 
get depleted of the protein. And what we showed is that actually here the protein is indeed immobilized by doing FRAP. And that if we inhibit the stimuli complex by treating the cells with two, the two APB, we can completely block myosin coaccumulation. And this tells us that nuclear positioning and not only in the nuclear membrane stretch allows cells to sense their physical deformation, but also to distinguish in between hypotonic, K, hypotonic swelling and mechanical confinement and to actually adapt the dynamics to the physical, uh, the, the physical properties of the environment they are. So concluding, what I showed you today is that mechanical uh, cells can sense mechanical confinement thanks to inner nuclear membrane unfolding and CPLA2 activation. This uh, leads to arachidonic acid production and uh, further controls myosin to activation uh, and recruitment at the cortex. And then cellular contractility, the regulation of cellular contractility is really sufficient to control the behavior of cells and, for example, to induce um, stable blood motility. And the same pathway combined with the information about nuclear positioning and nuclear to plasma membrane proximity that controls calcium level allows cells also to distinguish these two different types of deformation. So anisotropic confinement, um, deformation in confinement or isotropic swelling and to really, and really allow cells to tune their dynamic behavior to the physical space they are. And just as I mentioned, so this paper I'm sorry, this is wrong, but so this study was published back to back with another paper that proved that the same pathway is actually functioning, uh, functional in HeLa cells and in immune cells and really allows different types of cells to sense the physical deformation they, they have. And therefore, uh, uh, we suggest it's a general principle in cell. And with this, I conclude. I have to thank my uh, both supervisors and all my lab members for the help and you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any question. Thank you, Valeria, that was beautiful. Um, questions? I think people can unmute themselves. There are questions from the audience. Maybe I can start and then hopefully people mm -hmm. will follow. I had a question about the mechanism of the calcium. Um, I wasn't sure if I understood correctly. So you need higher calcium in order for myosin mm -hmm. to be recruited. But the curtain that you drew with the ORI was that the calcium is being secreted from the ER into the extracellular space. So, no, so we believe it's the opposite. So the ER releases calcium to the cytosol. This is mm -hmm. why if we collate intracellular calcium, we block everything. But if we uh, only uh, prevent the outer, calcium is not so drastic. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, we're still not sure how then the stimuli would work, but uh, we believe that if the calcium was in the ER and then goes to the cytosol, probably goes also in the nucleus. And this is where actually we need calcium because it's really needed for CPLA2 to bind to the nuclear membrane. So if there is no calcium, CPLA2 cannot bind. And actually by cleaving off this binding domain, you are blocking the activity of the protein. So calcium has to really be in the nucleus and in the, and yeah, I mean, we're still not sure how the nuclear calcium is regulated because right. this is really, I don't know, there is not so much in literature and whether it is functionally regulated or it's like continuous with ER, this is also not so clear still. I see. Okay. But if we block this 2 APB, uh, this stimuli with the 2 APB, we also block calcium. Okay. And this we could we could uh, quantify. Okay, thank you. I think Rachel has a question. Rachel, do you want to unmute and ask? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I was just um, wondering if you know what role differential levels of chromatin compaction or lamin composition, which we know can affect the stiffness of the nucleus, how that might impact um, the this mechanism. Does that impact the way that the nucleus responds to the confinement? Yeah, so this is really interesting and it's not so uh, easy to answer. So what we know is that if in here, so our cells are stem cells, so they do not have lamin A. This is why the right. nucleus maybe looks so floppy and soft. Right. And But if you remove the lamin A from HeLa cells, then they don't do proper unfolding and then you don't activate the pathway. Hmm. And what we're trying now to do is to do the opposite in our cells. 
and it also looks at whatever you do with the nuclear envelope, like really playing around with lamine or other proteins can really affect nuclear envelope stretching upon confinement and then would block the response. So it's not clear for me how removing lamine A from a cell that has this pathway functional prevents everything, but our cells have no lamine A are still capable to do it. So this is not super, yeah. Here and uh, yeah, probably they have a lot of other differences that then maybe balance each other and allow, let's say, the process to happen. But uh, let's say a good nuclear envelope is, is needed for the process and yeah, for the pathway in general, but more for the physical unfolding. And about the chromatin, so the point is, how do you change chromatin compaction without changing nor volume, nor nuclear envelope? Mm. shape nor anything else right so yeah so like be super interesting i guess simple simplistic treatments like uh histone deacetylase inhibitors or something like that um may also i guess affect some of those other things mm. as a byproduct but hmm. yeah yeah i mean for us so these cells we, our cells divide super fast like every half an hour right so we need to be fast in doing whatever treatment without killing them. But if you have something in mind that you're sure doesn't affect anything else, let me know. I would be really <laughs> happy to try. Uh, we try a few things, but then if you make the nucleus smaller, then it's like, okay, then you squeeze the same height. And of course you don't get the same phenotype. Right, right, yeah. Because sometimes if you compact out the protein, the, the chromatin, you, you The nucleus shrinks, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, actually, maybe related to that, um, do different cells, uh, maybe depending on the size and the stiffness of the nucleus, have a different um, threshold for this transition? Mm. Is that known? Yeah, so the HeLa cells starts to activate the pathway, I think, underneath 5 micrometer. And before that, it's really nothing. So it looks a bit more like biphasic. So it's like really probably because of the high laminate. The laminate is known to act like as a shock absorber. So maybe absorb, mm. absorb, absorb, and then at some point it unfolds. Nice. and activates the pathway nice. and what we checked is actually in, so in the developing embryo we know that cell size and nuclear size are regulated so the, the embryo when there is only one cell it's huge and the nucleus is also quite big but still the nuclear size compared to the cell size is much smaller mm -hmm. so as the cells grow up in develop i mean as the cell uh, are dissociated from later developmental stages the nucleus gets bigger with respect to the cell mm -hmm. and if we can find really early stages cells we cannot squeeze the nucleus Mm -hmm. So the more point, it's really when we start squeezing it, the cell breaks up. I see. It's mm -hmm. it's impressive, and later stage cells have same nuclear size, and the the cell is smaller in comparison, and we get the same response. Okay, interesting. I don't know if this has a role. It's a functional role in development, but right. it would be interesting yeah. to to understand. That would be cool. Um, Sebastian has a question. Do you want to unmute Sebastian? I don't know if he's still here. I can read it. Um, it says, I was wondering if there is a refractory period after mechanical stimulation. Does the nucleus need to return to its unperturbed state before it may sense a second stimulus? So this is quite immediate. So as soon as we release the confinement, I showed you that uh, myosin goes back, but also the nucleus is uh, recovering its, ruffle, its ruffles, let's say. Mm -hmm. And we know, I mean, we try to confine again and we get again the, the same myosin. We were not incredibly fast in this. So we always like try to image some cells. So we always waited at least 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And also then you would induce a lot of shear force going up and down so fast. So I don't know if you do it in a, I don't know, millisecond, but I mean, the nucleus is viscoelastic. So probably if you really go to the viscous time scale, then if it's not behaving elastic, the process won't happen because we really did require this elasticity of the nucleus for the process so i'm not sure if you do like i don't know a millisecond shot probably nothing will happen i don't know which time scale um, he was uh, referring to but yeah we need to keep all of this in mind mm -hmm. sounds good any other questions from the audience i don't uh, see anything okay. in the chat so i think um that's all the questions let's uh thank valeria one more time Thank you Thank so you. much. That was really beautiful and interesting. Thank you so much.